Thank you so much. I, I'm so pleased for this opportunity to address this gathering of classical Lutheran educators. Um, I'm a little worried about having to follow that recitation, presentation, however. Although it makes me feel good that I'm among friends to be talking about poetry, in which I'm going to be talking about tonight. I want to first of all thank the organization's leaders for this invitation, especially Eric Mildred, one of my outstanding former students. Uh, I've titled my address tonight, Scripture, Art, and Poetry, Even When You're Drowning. If you're a teacher like I am, then you know how it feels to be drowning. Awash in preparation and grading, flooded by demands on every side, trying some days just to keep your head above the water. On one level, what I want to do tonight is to encourage you with a scriptural message from Christ to drowning disciples of all ages. On another level, however, I want to advocate for a kind of teaching that brings together the three disciplines of my title, scripture, art, and poetry. To teach students about the word made flesh, we ought to take advantage of how the art forms of poetry and painting actually help make that word flesh in tangible ways. Knowledge about how art works gives students access to new worlds. But in addition to visual literacy, we must also cultivate a taste for poetry as an imaginative way of knowing crafted by imaginative beings made in the image of God and therefore capable of revealing um, truth. By giving students an ear for meter, an eye for composition and visual imagery, and an intellect that sees patterns and tensions, we help them see how beauty and order can be made out of chaos. A student who can read a poem has a new world to inhabit. I just saw some of that in this place. Classical Lutheran schools, I believe, have an opportunity to help rescue poetry, especially, though not exclusively, formal poetry, from a culture that seems increasingly tone deaf to it. I find that students come to college knowing less and less about poetry every year. Maybe because their teachers are uncertain about teaching it, Maybe because they come from schools imprisoned by common core standards that have no place for poetry. Many students seem unable to recognize a metrical poem or to even hear the meter when it's pointed out to them. I can't help but add here, although this is tangential to my topic, that one weapon the classical Lutheran school has in this battle for poetry is the hymn. Looking just at my own experience, I'm convinced that metrical poetry seems natural to me because I grew up singing hymns. So much so that I eventually started writing them. But young people who grew up in a culture without hymnody lack the metrical pulse that eventually starts to beat its ways into their hearts and minds. We need poetry of all kinds. Tonight, my goal is to illustrate how poems and paintings on New Testament subjects not only teach students about poetry and art, but enrich their experience of scripture. To that end, I've chosen two poems and two paintings about two related gospel accounts, Jesus walking on the water and Jesus still in the storm. The poems and artists the poets and artists are not especially well known, so perhaps I might give even you poetry rich folks something new that you can take home. The poems and the images are on the handouts. I'm also going to put images on the screen. I wish the images were of even better quality, but we'll do the best that we can. The stories surrounding these artists are also interesting, reminding us that art sometimes comes through unlikely people or unusual circumstances. Consider these test cases in how poetry and art can become a part of your teaching, and how, ideally, scripture, art, and poetry become one coherent whole, a unity of truth communicated in artful ways. The story of Jesus walking on the water is a familiar one. When the disciples see Jesus walking toward them, they are initially afraid, but soon Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. 
It's a kind of dare, but Jesus plays along. At first, Peter is okay, but the sight of the waves makes him start to sink, and he cries, Lord, save me. At this point, Jesus reaches his hand to Peter, catches him, and says, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? We will look at a poetic narrative of this in just a moment, but let's start with this painting on your handout here. Whichever one is easier for you to look at the screen or the handout, please do. Um, this is a painting by Alessandra Allori, who's a Florentine Mannerist painter, student of Bronzino, employed by the Medici's, and he was deeply affected by a trip he took to Rome to see the work of Michelangelo, whose influence we see in the figures here. Mannerism, a kind of interlude between the Renaissance and the Baroque, was all about style, and many find their works affected. Some say it looks like Laurie is painting two-dimensional statues, or one could say that the figures of Jesus and Peter here resemble two actors posed on a stage illuminated by a follow spot. But in their expressions and gestures, they take on flesh and personality, which then helps us see the spiritual truth of the narrative. And I don't know how much of this detail you'll be able to see, either on your hand or where you are, but the muscles in Peter's left arm and leg are taut and strained, as if Peter's left leg is still pushing off a slightly solid wave, while the right sinks beneath the surface. His tense forearm muscles suggest that he's holding tightly onto Jesus. But I think the eyes tell us the most. Peter's wide-eyed pleading looks desperate, or else profoundly grateful for Jesus' hand. What's interesting is to contrast his face and gestures with those of Christ, who stands upright and looks down, eyes almost closed, in a pose of both serenity and kindness. Holding Peter with his right hand, Jesus gestures with his left, as if he's punctuating the remark, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The image captures Peter's desperation and Jesus' complete control. We shouldn't forget, of course, about the frantic disciples in the boat behind, who seem almost oblivious to the drama in the foreground. Looking at the painting compositionally, note how Allori creates a kind of zigzag line through the picture plane, from the lower right up to Jesus' face, following Peter's arm and sight line, then back to the upper right from the angle of Jesus' head through the line of the boat, and then finally back to the upper left, using the sail, the mast, towards the distant castle and rock. The diagonal lines heighten the drama, creating motion and instability, and yet the space of the three primary masses produces a balanced, coherent, and beautiful whole. Now, Allori tells this story in line and shape and color, but Joseph Beaumont paints the narrative in words, images, meter, and rhyme. First, let me make a few comments about this poem. I'm sharing with you 30 lines of a poem first published in 1648 that is 39,000 lines long, almost four times the length of Milton's Paradise Lost, which was published 20 years later. Some have actually called it the longest poem in the English language. And for having written a work of this unique distinction, Joseph Beaumont is almost entirely forgotten. One 19th century critic actually said that to read it through nowadays were to perform a purgatorial penance. <laughs> Beaumont's title page. Beaumont's title page reads, Psyche, or Love's Mystery, in 20 cantos, displaying the intercourse betwixt Christ and the soul by Joseph Beaumont, Master of Arts and Ejected Fellow of St. Peter's College in Cambridge. It's quite a title page. Beaumont calls himself an Ejected Fellow because he was a royalist at the time of the English Civil War when Cambridge swung towards the rebel side and all of the royalists lost their teaching positions. 
Beaumont says in his preface that, I deliberated for the avoiding of your idleness, what task I might safeliest presume, and concluded upon composing this poem. Not many people respond to unemployment by writing the world's longest poem, as if he needed something to do. In this poem, the soul of a fashionable young woman is led by her guardian angel on an allegorical journey through various temptations. This is, by the way, about 25 years before Bunyan writes Pilgrim's Progress. The journey involves transhistorical trips to Palestine to view scenes from the life of Christ, where the soul learns spiritual truths. In Canto 10, about halfway through this monstrous poem, we find the story of Peter walking to Jesus on the water. Now, one critic has called this poem a rather dull allegory, but yet one that is studied with the rarest beauties. I'd like to think that perhaps this section is one of those beauties. I've given you six stanzas in your handout of many thousand, all of which are written in iambic pentameter and rhyme A, B, A, B, C, C. Incidentally, just to go back to my hymn fetish for a moment, six lines of iambic pentameter is the meter of the hymn tune Finlandi. So you can technically sing all 39,000 lines of psyche to the tune of Be Still My Soul, although I wouldn't recommend that. I do, however, sometimes make my students sing a stanza of a poem, even a secular one, to a familiar hymn tune, just to make the point about how meter works. Now, back to walking on the water. I'm picking up Beaumont's poem in the middle of the story when Peter decides to leave the boat and walk to Jesus. What I'm going to do is to read the first three stanzas, then make some comments, and then come back to the final two. So bear with me as I read here. Beaumont writes, But fervent Peter, rousing up his heart, in confidence's arc, resolved to ride above this flood. Though back the rest did start, he forward pressed and valiantly cried, O oh, bid thy humble servant, O oh, bid thy ready humble servant meet, if thou our master art thy blessed feet. Come then, his gracious master cried, but as he labored forward, lo, an eye swollen wave, tumbling and foaming in his way, alas, did all his courage instantly out brave. His heart sunk first, and then his feet, and all but his tongue, which sadly to his Lord did call. Had any other Lord but he been the Lord, with what indignant scorn would he have made his faithless subject meet his censure, where he, more in sin than in the sea, did wade? But now omnipotence itself expressed pity to him, and dared, who dared its powers distrust. Wow, that's a lot to take in. Let me point out just a couple of things about it. Notice in the first two lines how Beaumont metaphorically uses the story of the great flood. Peter rouses up his heart and foolishly decides that he will ride in the ark of confidence over the flood waters before him. He goes valiantly forward even as the other disciples fall back. Some of Beaumont's cleverness can be seen in that second stanza where he breaks the iambic meter to start line three, tumbling and foaming in its way so that the wave tumbles at us uh, as a trochee, not an iamb. Sorry, I'm geeking out on meter just a little bit. <laughs> but he also personifies this wave, noting how it outbraves Peter's courage. What a great word. Outbrave. It's an actual word according to the OED, being the act of outdoing someone in bravery. So much for Peter and his confidence arc. But the best part of the second stanza, I think, is the couplet in which Beaumont uses the verb sink to govern multiple objects, some literal, some metaphorical. First sinks Peter's heart. This metaphorical sinking is followed by the sinking of his literal feet, and then almost everything else, except his tongue, still above the water, with which he can call on Jesus for help. It's clever writing. 
But what a spiritual lesson about our predilection for pride and self-sufficiency, which are often then followed by desperate cries when things don't go as we expected. The third stanza adds a profound truth about the nature of Christ, who here embodies a virtue we need to encourage in our students. Beaumont reminds us that any other Lord besides Jesus would have used Peter's sinking as an opportunity for indignant scorn and censure. How we all love to say, I told you so, when we're right and somebody else fails. But Jesus does not break the bruised reed. Jesus sees that Peter's problem is a spiritual one. Peter is waiting in sin more than he is waiting in the waves, with Beaumont again using the verb wade to govern two different things, one physical and the other spiritual. His sin is pride and failure to trust, yet divine omnipotence here exercises divine pity on Peter, who had dared to distrust divine power. This is a powerful gospel moment. The omnipotent empties himself and shows mercy. Now let's turn to the final two stanzas. <clears throat> Jesus, whose ear delights to hear the cry of suppliants, those sinners, reached his hand, that hand where only dwells security, that hand which rules the stubborn ocean and measures it in its palm, and snatched him out from that deep sea and from his deeper doubt. And then, O oh thou of little faith, said he, why did that weak suspicion press thee down? What made thee so forget, almighty me, who can in their own waves all tempests drown? Learn now and blush that winds and billows know the power of their maker more than thou. First of all, how comforting is Beaumont's assertion that Jesus loves to hear the cry of suffering sinners and reach his hand to save them. That hand, the source of true security, snatched Peter from the deep sea. But notice how, once again, Beaumont uses a verb to govern two terms, one literal and one metaphorical. Snatching Peter from the sea, yeah, it was great, but Beaumont says that Jesus snatched Peter from his deeper doubts, the more severe spiritual problem. One more thing about this poem. In the last stanza, lines three and four, Jesus asked how Peter could forget almighty me, which I have to say makes me laugh a little, making Jesus sound like something of a superhero, almighty me. In a great paradoxical moment, Jesus reminds Peter that he can drown the tempests in their own waves. An image that beautifully puzzles the imagination. I'm trying to picture how that can be. And then Beaumont has Jesus say, learn now. Here comes the didactic moment. In other words, here's the lesson. Personifying the elements, Jesus tells Peter that the winds and the waves, inanimate objects though they be, actually know God's power better than Peter does. Ouch, that's a hard lesson. But the admonition comes after a breathtaking depiction of the gospel, of Christ's compassion and his saving power. Rhetorically, these 30 lines paint the story in a way that invites and rewards poetic analysis. When we read a poem closely enough to notice these kinds of things, I think we usher students into the new world that a poem creates, a world that can spark their imagination. And spiritually, a poem like this puts flesh on our God and forgives our vanity, lifts us up in our drowning moments, and controls the universe by his power. You've been very patient with that long expl explication, especially after a long day of a meal. Why am I doing this? Um, <clears throat> but I hope you'll let me end my remarks here today with uh, 
a shorter reflection, perhaps, on another painting and poem. This time about a related potential drowning, and that is Jesus stilling the storm. I begin with this painting by Eugene Delacroix, an 18th century French romantic painter. He's probably the most famous of the four figures in my talk. What's unusual about including him here is that he typically painted portraits or sometimes grand historical events. He was not a religious man, nor did he often paint religious subjects. A child of the Enlightenment, Delacroix was raised as a rationalist and an agnostic. Later in his life, however, he painted this scene of Christ's disciples on the stormy sea at least six different times. This vision, this version of Christ on the Sea of Galilee is the one uh, currently at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. What art historians believe is that it reflects his own inner turmoil at a time of spiritual questing. Some evidence suggests that he found himself drawn to the claims of Christianity late in his life as he searched for some kind of meaning. For such a man, the account of the seeking disciples' doubt may have spoken to him in a very special way. Now, any artist who wants to paint this story must make first the decision about what moment in the narrative to capture. You may remember that Jesus and the disciples are overtaken by a sudden storm while sailing across the Sea of Galilee. Inexplicably, Jesus is sleeping through it all until the disciples wake him, saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? The awakened Jesus orders the tempest to be still and then rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith. Now, some artists have depicted the authoritative Jesus standing up in the boat with outstretched arm, commanding the wind and the waves to cease. That is the most dramatic approach to him. Delacroix chooses an earlier moment, painting Jesus sleeping beside some very frightened disciples. Delacroix puts Jesus exactly where Mark's account says we should find him, in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Notice how he puts a halo glow around Jesus' head to help us identify him, and shows his head propped up against his fist, his arm bent at the elbow. It does not look comfortable to him, or sleep inducing actually at all. The drama of this painting comes from the surging waves and the panicked disciples, all of whom are doing different things. And I don't know how well you can see this, either on the screen or on your, on your handout. Um, I'm tempted to read these disciples almost as emblematic of various approaches to dealing with a crisis. One crouched disciple, way up here in the bow, clings to a vertical board for dear life. The next two passengers, the oarsmen, struggle vainly to row against the powerful waves. There are two disciples in the center of the boat who raise their arms into the air, one of them waving what seems to be a red cloak, and another with arms outstretched, either in panic or attempting to make some kind of signal. On the starboard side, someone reaches for a pole or an oar that's lost in the water. And way in the stern behind Jesus, there's another figure who's trying to work the rudder, hoping he might steer them through all of the storm. Mark's Gospel says that the boat was nearly swamped. Wow, and Delacroix paints just that. Notice how close the sea is to the top of the boat. The terrified disciples may be on the verge of waking Jesus. Notice how, like in the Allori painting, this Jesus is the picture of serenity amidst all of the chaos. And these disciples, like Allori's, look desperate and helpless. 
And so they wake Jesus. The disciples may have done what we sometimes do, and that is to turn to Jesus only when all else has failed. Or maybe we would delay because we would just rather not disturb him. Worse yet, we may doubt whether Jesus is awake at all. This is the nagging fear addressed by Hartley Coleridge in his sonnet, But Jesus Slept. I'll end my remarks by taking a brief look at this last poem, written by a man who himself lived a rather desperate and chaotic life. According to Anne Fadiman, Hartley Coleridge is remembered but for two things and two things only. He was the son of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, his far more famous father. That's number one. And number two, he was a disappointment. He had been a brilliant and eccentric child prodigy who entered Oxford University with great promise, earned a BA and received a graduate fellowship, only to lose it after a year because of what what one historian called uncontrolled drinking and lack of application. It's interesting, isn't it, how there seem to be some of those college students in every generation. <laughs> Hartley spent the rest of his life wandering from job to job, a little teaching, a little writing, shiftless, never having a real home, never getting his act together. People like to call him poor Hartley. But he did like to write poems, especially sonnets. He loved the rhythm of them. Fadiman, in fact, says that when Hartley was out on a stroll, he would sometimes hatch an idea for a sonnet, run into the nearest farmhouse, borrow paper, and dash it off in 10 minutes, beating time with his foot. When teaching meter and poetry, by the way, both foot stomping and desk thumping are to be encouraged. Whatever helps students hear those accented syllables. This particular song of Hartman's is called, But Jesus Slept. Its opening lines being, or words, being the three word fragment from the end of Matthew 8, verse 24. The abrupt opening is actually a good lesson in how to begin something in media stratus to get your reader's attention. Let's look at the first seven lines, and then the last seven. But Jesus slept. By the way, I have rhyme scheme letters in the right hand side. But Jesus slept. The inland sea was wild, and the good son of Mary was asleep. For sleep he did, an infant meek and mild, and fain he would, and fain he would not we. As peevish fond as any other child, close to the virgin breast he longed to creep and feel the warmth of mother undefiled. Now typically, a sonneteer puts a full stop at the end of the octave, line eight, but crazy and unconventional Hartley ends his sentence with a period after line seven, thus dividing the sonnet into two equal seven-line halves. Unusual approach. He also starts the poem rhyming like it's a Shakespearean sonnet, and then he switches to the Petrarchian form in the third quadrant. Despite not following the rules, the first half of the poem is really pretty straightforward. The emphasis is on Jesus' humanity. Of course Jesus slept, Hartley says, going into great detail about how much the infant Jesus must have loved creeping onto the Virgin Mary's breast and sleeping there in the warmth of her embrace. So we shouldn't be surprised to find him asleep. But now, in this perfect midway point of the song, Hartley shifts not only from the sleeping to the waking Jesus, but also from the human to the divine Jesus. And here's the last seven lines. And now, the shepherd of the chosen sheep, does he not watch? Oh, 
vain and faithless quest. He slept a man, but lo, he wakes our God. What man is this, at whose almighty nod the winds are still and every wave at rest? Tis he whose seeming sleep approves our faith, but ever wakes to save us from the death. Coleridge actually allows himself to briefly ask the same question of the disciples. Don't you care if we drown? Or doth he not watch, as Coleridge asks. But he immediately dismisses the quest, that's the question, as being vain and faithless. He slept a man, Hartley says, but lo, he wakes our God. Coleridge then ends his poem by noting how the disciples react to Jesus' miracle. Mark's Gospel says that they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Or, as Coleridge puts it here in lines 11 and 12, What man is this, at whose almighty nod the winds are still and every wave at rest? Hartley's line depends upon the iron beam of referring to a nod, the most modest of gestures, as almighty, when it's Jesus' nod. And when we consider that nod can also mean to sleep, Hartley's word choice adds another layer of resonance as if Jesus could rule the universe even while he was asleep. What are we to do, the poem ultimately asks, when Jesus seems asleep in the midst of all of our troubles? Hartley's answer is that Christ's seeming sleep approves our faith. Approves here meaning to test or to validate. When Christ seems to be sleeping, our faith is tested. We are prone to complacency about our trust in God when life offers placid seas and smooth sailing. During storms, we are forced to realize the limits of our own resources and so place ourselves into his hands. The bottom line is that Jesus always wakes up. As Hartley states in his final line, Jesus ever wakes to save us from the death. That second last word here is a bit jarring because we don't typically put the article the before the word death. I suspect that Coleridge is referring to the big death, the ultimate spiritual death that Christ saves us from. After all, the disciples who were saved from death by water that day on the Sea of Galilee each met a physical death by a different means and at a later date. But when Christ rose on the third day from the sleep of death, he rescued all of his disciples from the death, winning for us the ultimate victory. Scripture, of course, is the ultimate authority for this story. It makes us wise into salvation. So what can poetry and painting really do? One final line from Joseph Bowen's preface to his psyche says this well. He said, that he would feel like he had partly achieved his purpose if he had charmed his readers into any true degree of devotion. The word I'm drawn to here is the word charm. Religious devotion, of course, is not some magic trick, but the charm that Oman refers to is that quality that excites love or imagination. It actually reminds me of C.S. Lewis's longing for enchantment and his belief that the arts are the key to re-enchanting the cosmos. Let's use paintings and poems to expand the vision of our students. Images and texts can open their eyes, organize their thoughts, and ring in their ears. In this way, the incarnate word takes on a special kind of flesh 
and people's hearts and minds are opened to the beauty of God. I thank you for enduring my poetry explications. God bless you. God bless your teaching. And may you ever take the hand of Jesus on those drowning days. Thank you.